Okay, so I'm just going to do a quick, so everybody can see my notebook to start with. Yeah, cool. Okay, so I'm going to do a quick run through of the PyTorch Python package. Um, so this is going to be more of a how you could use certain features in PyTorch, not so much a, an introduction to machine learning because that could be a take a lot longer to do that. But I'll try and give a general overview of certain aspects. So for those who don't know, PyTorch is an open source machine learning package. And I, it's quite common that you can use in Python. Um, and one of its benefits is that it has its own, it's got its own version of arrays called tensors. And these are really useful because you can run these on whatever architecture you want. So you can use CPUs, GPUs, Google's own version of that, and et cetera. So it's quite handy to work in this. So first, I thought I'd give a quick overview of what these tensors are. So in a nutshell, tensors are pretty much the same as a NumPy array. It's got similar, similar features. Most of the operations that NumPy can do, um, these tensors can do as well. But with the added benefit that these tensors can be directly moved to a GPTU to actually use them, whereas for NumPy, you can't do that, so NumPy doesn't actually work on GPUs. You have to, there's a module called QPy, so C-U-P-Y, I think. Might have misremembered that, but it's got another library that you'd have to use instead. So yeah, so you can create these tensors similar way as you do NumPy stuff. You can go from a list, you just convert it to a tensor, and there it is, or turn a matrix into a tensor, or if you were already starting with NumPy arrays, you can, there's a function built into PyTorch that says from NumPy, and you can just directly import that and similar sort of features. And it would be similar with pandas arrays as well. I've only just thought of that option. Um, but in a similar way, PyTorch will have an option to import your pandas arrays. So it's really easy to go from whatever your base data is to what PyTorch wants you to use. So that's just to show you. And then it'll have similar attributes that NumPy or XArray will have too, so you can find out things about it. And one of the useful attributes that you can find out is if you do dot device on any tensor array, you can find out what device it's actually it's being stored on. So here, because I'm just on my own computer, this was stored on a CPU. But if I was running on a GPU on Gaddy, for example, I can have I could have set this device to be one of those. And it's really useful to know which device these tensors are on because you you can't have when you're running your model, if you have your data on the CPU and your model loaded on a GPU, it doesn't it doesn't work like that. It doesn't know how to communicate. So you need to have all of these in this the one device. So that is important when you go into more complex things. So then again, these tensors can do the same sort of manipulation and, multiple, and mathematical operations that you can do on any other. So you've got just an adding, add 10 to everything, multiply matrices, and et cetera. Okay, the mean of them, similar to xarray.mean, and all of that. And it's got the same indexing. So you can select a specific point in that tensor, like you could in an umpire array. So I want all of these to turn to, to one. So then working on GPUs. So when you might not sound like it's something you want to do right now, but when you have or build a really complex uh, machine learning uh, model with PyTorch, it actually will become great benefit to use a GPU to run this. And thankfully, PyTorch has made this really simple. So anytime you want to move your PyTorch model or your data to the GPU, that's all you've got to do. So it's called CUDA because Python in GPU is CUDA. That's just what it's called. So I'm sorting a CPU and I've got a, oops, that's not it. So this is, 
Well, I'll go through all this in a minute, but this is on. I didn't have it printed. Yeah. Anyway, it's good. I'll show that later. Anyway. So that's just the basics intro into tensors. So a huge part of PyTorch and a huge part of machine learning in general is data, is working with your data and get your data into the right setup and having it filling in missing data or putting in the way you want it to be able to do your machine learning model. So that's so that's why these tensors are quite important. So you can understand what's going on. Anything you pass into your model will become a tensor. And it's just pays to know how that works. So yeah, so there's three main components that of the benefits of PyTorch. So the first was tensors. The second is modules. So this is a function from PyTorch. And a module basically loads in your model and keeps all the information of your model, which I'll show in a sec. Yeah, so then there's also parameters that you can assign to this and optimizers. So the optimizers are the algorithms you choose um, to do your machine learning process to update the model, to update the weights on the data, to train it, then to do the loss functions and the back propagation stuff, which will become more obvious. So I thought the best way to show the benefit of PyTorch would be just to create a super simple neural network. So there's this database called CIFAR10, which just contains images of loads of different animals and vehicles and stuff like that. And there's loads of other subsets in that. But just to be really simple, I'm just going to take this data set and apply it on animals. So I've called an animal net. So first you just import all your modules, which is just Torch. So Torch is PyTorch, which is the module what the module is called. And all of them, then the first important step is you create how you want, you create your neural network, basically. You want to, you create how with the steps in which your data needs to be refined for this model to work. So there's a lot of information, it's not complicated. I should say, I've written this notebook so that it will go up on the CMS blog afterwards if you want to go through this yourself or if you want to read these comments and information more closely. Okay. So the first step that I did was I've created four convolution layers in my network. So this is basically four steps that I want my machine learning model to try and calculate, to try and figure out what parts of the image can be associated with a specific class of animal. So here I've loaded in. So all these images that have gone in are 32 by 32 pixels and they've got three layers of color. So RGB, basically. So that's just saying, so that's all the information that's going into it. And then I want this to be outputted as a, a 512 1D array. So I should say that, yeah, so I'm flattening it into a 1D array because that's how PyTorch would like it. So that's my first convolution layer. So I want that to output at 512 and I want it to simplify even more Tell me what features then can you associate and simplify it more. And then when it outputs, I just want 10 classes or yeah, I just want it. I just want 10 classes to be in there. I cat, dog, whatever all the animals are. So next you set up the function, the forward function that applies all of these. So X, so this is my data. So reshapes my images into a 2D tensor. Then this X goes through the first convolution layer. That's all that happens. Then it goes through the second, then it goes through the third, and then it comes out on the fourth. And it just gives me the single word that I'm looking for. I don't care about any of the other features. So I've written out a lot more information about what's going in there. And um, once you can have a look into that later, when I when I put this up on the blog. So I should say this is specific. All of this is specific to my current situation. So I have these images that are going through, and I've chosen these as the steps. Doesn't necessarily mean that's the best way to go about it. 
a lot about machine learning is you you just try see what this output is, try something else, see if it gives you a better estimate, and so on. So there are different ways of doing this. You could add more layers, you could add less layers, you can change how complex these layers are. So then, like I said before, important thing when using modules like this is the actual data manipulation. So there's, this isn't important. This is just that the data set, I just wanted to look at animals. But this data set contained a ton of categories, vehicles and other sorts of things, but I didn't want any of those. So I had to go through this data and take out only the information I want. So how I do that's not important. It was more, it's more important just for the fact that all data needs to be looked at before it goes in. You only want the things that matter. You don't want to pass in information that might upset your model. Like I don't have randomly want a an image of a plane to appear because I'll just confuse the situation entirely. Okay, so this is just downloading the data. In, in machine learning, where you want two data sets to, you want two data sets when, so you want to have one that can train. So this is my training data set. I'm telling it that this is my data. I want you to take out a subset of that data for training, which is, then I pass it into this data loader. So this data loader is a PyTorch function, which it just keeps all the information on your data set. So you can't change it. And then from this data set, I don't want this to train. I now want this, I just want this for testing. So by saying train false means this is now your testing data set. So it's separated, let's say I have a thousand images. This will then separate that into, let's say 500 for training and 500 for testing. And then these are the classes that I want to look at. Okay, so just for an example, these are the sort of images. So I've, I've reduced their quality just to make this algorithm run a bit faster. So just to show you the sort of images we're looking at, so that's a cat, bird, horse. So these were random, dog and dog. But as you can see, they'll have features that should be really obvious. Like we can tell what they are. Um, and that's what all those layers in the convolution network should hopefully pick up as well. So here is the main training for PyTorch. So you create your model which I've called animal net. So that was that class at the very start where it's going through the forward functions and sets up each convolution layer. Then the next important feature is your optimizer. So this is the model that's going to optimize how good your, your model is. There's several, there's loads of these. This doesn't, this is just one that is supposedly good at image detection. Doesn't mean it's the best solution for me right now. You would go onto the PyTorch website and see all the different optimizers that they have available and you'd look into how they work, what equations do they use, and you can try different ones. Again, you try different ones and see which one are best for your situation and which one learns the best. This one is just common for these sort of things. That's why I've used it. So yeah, so it's it's popular choice for for this. Next, you want to specify what loss function you want to use, and in a nutshell, you could have a whole day's talk on what a loss function does and how it works. But in a nutshell, it's an equation that you give your model a data set, and it will calculate, and it'll see how accurate it is. Then it passes that information into the loss function, and the loss function will try and see how far away the model actually was from the answer. And then it'll pass it into a backwards propagation function, which basically calculates the gradients of a loss and then passes it back into the model so that when you rerun this step, it can try and see if it has a better, opt a better estimate of what's going on. So we put all that together. So an epoch is basically one run over a data set. So I ran over the data set 20 times. Um, 
So yeah, so I take the data out of here. I, I clear the gradient because by default, PyTorch sums them and we don't want that. We want them each time I, I run this, I just want them to be zero. I pass the data into the model. So the data goes into my model. So this is my model equals animal net. So I pass the data into the model. It predicts the output. It then passes that output into my loss function and sees how terrible that is. And then it'll pass that back into these two steps to try and update the model parameters and try and get a better answer. So down here, each run, so it's run, it runs two times per epoch to try and get better. So you want, the closer this is to zero, the better. So you can imagine your loss function, a very, very simple loss function is, let's say in a 2D line, your loss function sort of there will be a local minimum somewhere, and that's what you want. So th this will slowly go down every time I run my epochs. So as you can see, it started at 1.6, and it'll go down to 0 0.6. So the more, e the more epochs I give it, or the more times it loops within an epoch, the better, to a certain degree, until it finds what that local minimum is. So that could be the local minimum, because it's, it's kind of slowed down. Actually, to be honest, it's probably missed it a little bit. So in machine learning, there is a, such a thing as overestimating. And I may have done that a little bit. Not sure. I'd have to run for more to see what if it figures out if there's a lower one. So I do all that. Nice thing about PyTorch is it saves all of this information in this model. So everything you've done, you've saved into here. If I run this again for another 20 epochs, it'll save that all back into the animal net model. So it keeps all of this information constantly. So next you want to evaluate your model. So you can save it after this point. It's quite easy to save. I think I have one saved here, just for testing. And then you can load that at any point. You can do more training and you can constantly update this database. That's generally how it works. So then I want to evaluate my model. So this is after running for fit. 20 epochs, which took six minutes, not very much at all. So here I load in all my data. There's my model that I've just been training. I pass the data into it. And it runs through all the images that it has stored in that data and tells me how accurate it is, which for a six minute training, 50% accurate isn't terrible. You'd obviously want to run that for a lot more or Maybe you want to pass more images into it to train it more. There's a lot of things to make that better. So pass more images in, have a better data set. Um, maybe there's an, a different amount of classes, different amount of images in each class. Test with that. There's other features like maybe, like I said, that wasn't the right optimizer to use. You keep testing your optimizer. Maybe I overestimated and then there was a better thing. Maybe I'm using the wrong loss function. So PyTorch is handy in the way that it has all of these functions built into it. You just need to find which ones are best for your situation. OK, so 50%. So to test that on images themselves, so let's take six random ones, which pure randomness. Of course, it gives you three frogs. That's the ground truth. And then let's run, let's pass these six. So this is six random images from our from our testing data set, not from the data that has actually been trained on the upon. So it doesn't actually know what these are. Um, and then we pass those into our, our model instead, and it comes out with our prediction that of these. So it gets cat, it's obviously not a deer, and it gets frog, frog, cat, right? So it's got two rocks, so better than 50% in that case. And then in this specific case, you can actually ask it to tell me per class how accurate were you. And for some reason, it was really terrible for cats. And it was really good for a horse, even though a horse didn't come up. So yeah, so like I said, that's really, really quick introduction to PyTorch. The best place to go for a lot more info is the PyTorch website, they actually have an incredible amount of tutorials to go through a lot of different scenarios.
then just to show something uh, code built by Sana on the CMS GitHub actually uses PyTorch to downscale um, Evapo Trampism, this data set. And a lot of this is actually used to build a machine learning model on something climate related. So this is a really nice one to look at. Really nice one to look at if you want to see how you can actually apply it to a data set that you might be used to. This, in this instance, we have a, a pandas CSV data frame, which again, slightly different way of using it. So our convolution layers would have been very different to that. So, yeah, so if you have any questions about that, or I guess if you want any more, if you want me to go into any more detail in another code break on a specific part of this, then that I can do that too.